that's it. My time is up. I could talk for hours, as you can gather, I'm very passionate about this and related subjects. I want to leave you with the following thoughts. I truly believe that I have presented you today with incontrovertible evidence of a massive global hydraulic event coupled with massive tectonic happenings. Exactly how it happened, whether there was a comet or something else, that's second order stuff. The fact is, there has been a flood. I've given you some thoughts about coming judgment. I ask you please to seriously think about that. There's a choice, there's a fork in the road. You can reject what I say and continue going down whatever road you're going down. Or you can pause and ask the question. Is there really a creator? And yes, I can't explain where he came from, but it's no more difficult than assuming that all of this stuff around us came from nowhere. It's kind of roughly the same level of faith, I think. Actually, I find it easier to believe there is a creator. And then that there has been a series of judgments. And therefore, there is a reasonable possibility that there could be one last judgment. How are you going to live the rest of your life? Depending on which fork you take, could be a momentous decision. If you want more information, contact details are on the screen. Thank you for spending this time with me. In summing up, I'm going to review the entire presentation. For those of you who want to contact me, you can contact me at james at etimin.org or the fun or fax numbers on the screen. In the introduction, we introduced Northcliffe as a landmark for judgment as the pivot point for this whole presentation. And posed the question, was the topography we see today formed over millions of years or was it the result of a sudden catastrophic event? And asked the question, how did we explain the mountains and the valleys? We looked at bridges and said that engineers do not design bridges to stand up, they design them not to fall down, and I suggested for your consideration that your theory of topographic formation, your theory of the formation of the earth, your theory of where people came from, should be robust and subject to scrutiny, should stand up and not fall down. I suggested that you checked your theories and see whether it was tantamount to jumping off the top of a high-rise building, flapping your arms and crying, I can fly as you plunge to your death, or conjuring a rabbit out of a hat, or whether there was greater substance into what you believed about the topography that you see around you. I presented some of my credentials and made the assertion that I was talking with first-hand knowledge and experience about the formation of rocks and a variety of the other aspects of this presentation that I was talking about was not theoretical. We had a look at some results from my PhD research and noticed that the characteristics of every single test result was non-linear, frequently exponential. And I made the assertion that it is in fact so that the vast majority of physical phenomena in the world follow non-linear characteristics. We looked at a fundamental principle that extrapolation should be avoided and suggested that any form of extrapolation going back beyond where records existed had to be viewed with suspicion. I made the assertion that extrapolation of over millions or billions of years was invalid, taking account of nonlinear characteristics, that it was tantamount to an ant on a railway track, claiming to know where the train had come from, how long it took and the route it followed. We had a look at some images from NASA with regard to deep space. Uh, we looked at the birth of stars and a, a three light year high pillar of gas that you see there. Notice the instability, the continuous movement. We saw Comet Lulin, a dirty snowball, a mass of ice, 
only 160 times further away than the moon, in other words, close. And we postulated that such an, uh, a comet could fly by or even impact the Earth and melt and cause a flood. We looked at uh, massive chunks of ice in the Kuiper belt just outside the solar system and postulated that one of those could easily get dislodged uh, and strike the Earth or come close to hitting it. And we saw a crater on Mars which seemed to have the characteristics which would be consistent with a strike by an ice object. <coughs> We saw that catastrophic and dramatic change is fast and not gradual. And I suggested for your consideration that everything that we were looking at in this presentation was likely to have happened quickly. We then had a look at the South African gold mines and saw that they were comprised of very hard metamorphosed rock which dipped at 30 degrees and outcropped on Northcliffe and other areas with glass-like vitrified ceramic quartzite, extremely hard rock. We had a look at the stratigraphic column of the gold mining reserves, which is typically about two kilometers deep, and noted that the volume of water required for such uniform deposition is huge, and that there had to be massive water forces to have brought that material from somewhere. We noted also that the deepest mines were over four kilometers deep, and that was two kilometers below sea level, indicating again massive disruption of the surface. We looked at the 30 degrees dip of the gold mining of the gold reefs and questioned how that had happened, how these horizontally deposited layers could have been upthrust like that. We looked at the geology of the surface of the Vidvatasrand and saw how massively complex it was and how it spoke of massive surface disruption. And then we looked at a cross section of the the ore reserves, noting that not only did it dip at 30 degrees, but it was uh, intersected with faults thrusting up and down all over the place, indicating massive uh, turmoil and, and trauma of the Earth's surface. And then we saw that the top of that had been cut off and that horizontally bedded material had been laid down on top of it. We then had a look at sedimentary rock around the world, water-laid rock, we looked at Table Mountain in Cape Town, seeing that its horizontal layers just ended up in the middle of nowhere, just cut off on the sides. We looked at the Fish River Canyon and saw massive uh, deposits of horizontally bedded material with massive canyons incised into it. We saw similar characteristics at Niagara Falls and the Grand Canyon on an even more dramatic scale. Notice the horizontal layers. We saw that massive wave action can move huge volumes of material very rapidly as evidenced by this storm in Port Elizabeth in South Africa. From there we moved on to the halfway house granite dome, noted that the earth has a molten core that on occasion has upthrust to the surface. We saw that a dome is a massive granite intrusion as evidenced by the circular pink zone uh, in the map on the right. We saw graphically how the dome had upthrust uh, and forced up the horizontally bedded layers containing the gold and formed that into the uh, vitreous ceramic quartzite that we find today. We noted that this was consistent with a thin crust uh, and that this was consistent with progressive cooling and solidifying of the earth from the outside in. We noted that the characteristics of quartzite were very similar to the characteristics of hard uh, ceramic floor tiles, and the brittleness indicated that the rock could only have been deformed by the dome when it was soft. We looked at bending soft material over a dome and saw what the impact of that would be. From there we moved on to the African erosion surface a massive flat plain extending over much of Africa and widely recognized. We looked at a panorama from various areas around the Witwatersrand, seeing a uniform horizon, a level horizon, with the same characteristics all over the Witwatersrand. Noting here a slight curvature of the earth, but the horizon is uniformly level. We noticed that the spot heights 
around the Witwatersrand were remarkably uniform and that it would require major feat of engineering to achieve that level of uniformity. We noted that this indicated a mass of planing action by some external force, not something that could happen gradually over millions or billions of years. We looked at the art of plane and level, what it takes to produce level concrete slabs, for that matter level cakes, or rectangular and level furniture. We noted that it required specialist tools and that to produce large level surfaces required a large uniform grading mechanism. We postulated that this grading mechanism could have been massive tsunami waves ripping around the planet uniformly, cutting down layer upon layer. From there we looked at the valleys incised into the dome. We saw that the, the dome was not a uniform level surface, but in fact that there were valleys gouged into it, huge volumes of material eroded. We noticed that the valleys in themselves were broad and, and, and gently sloping, and that this was not consistent with the volume of water flowing in those streams. We noted that gentle rain does nothing, it is all about high velocity water and we looked at how the use of a water cannon in hydraulic mining moved huge volumes of material very rapidly. We looked at plucked cliff faces around South Africa and noticed that huge blocks of rock had just been plucked out of these cliff faces and were nowhere to be seen. We noticed that on top of the hills we also had similar plucking huge chunks of rock remaining, but other chunks of rock just disappeared. What should have been uniform deposits, uniform layers, anything but uniform. We asked the question, where is all the rock gone? Because the uh, slope is downhill all the way to the sea, and suggested that at the very least this material had to have been deposited in the low-lying areas of Limpopo province, if not in the Mozambique Channel, and that in, in addition to this, the material all had to have been removed through the Hodibiasport Dam Gorge, all of this consistent with huge hydraulic action. We looked at the characteristics of erosion of a small river with a limited bed load cutting a deep channel versus a large bed load cutting a wide flat valley, and we suggested that it was only possible to have cut the valleys that we have in the Witwatersrand around Johannesburg by huge volumes of material traveling at huge velocity. We concluded that the rock was not removed by ice, it did not evaporate, it did not dissolve, and it can only have been eroded by massive water suction resulting from extremely high velocity, possibly coupled with boiling water if the cutting back took place while the granite was still in a semi-molten state. We asked how this could happen. We noted that continental separation was a well-accepted reality with the continents fitting together. We noted that conventional theory says this took place gradually, but from a mechanical point of view, it must have happened rapidly. We noted in terms of the coefficient of thermal expansion that if the crust of the earth had been hot and cooled, that splitting of the crust was almost certain when subjected to very cold water from an ice object. We suggested that the continental separation and the water drainage that would result if this happened rapidly was totally consistent with the landforms that we see all over the planet. <laughs>